Josh Gulley from the psych department. And Josh, you've been working on drugs of abuse for a while, right? In the lab, yes. In the lab. <laughs> <laughs> he is our number <laughs> expert. And I'm here to tell you, I have seen him at the Winter Conference for Brain Research, which I also go to sometimes. And so I know that means that he's very highly regarded in the field. <laughs> and he told me when I asked him to participate in this class that although he's an expert on studying drugs of abuse, he hasn't looked at the literature on circadian rhythms and drugs of abuse until he engaged in this project. And so we're very excited that he agreed to come and tell us about it. Thank you. Appreciate the invitation. Uh, and that's true. I don't, uh, I guess you're not supposed to admit this at the beginning of when you're going to talk about something uh, or you have this in your title, but <laughs> it's true. I don't know much about circadian rhythms. Um, and so the uh, approach that I took uh, for this talk was to um, try to focus on the models that are used to address this question of the role of circadian rhythms in addiction. Uh, and in particular, to focus on how we might assess addiction in animal models, because I think that that is a, is a pretty important issue that is uh, highly overlooked. Um, and so that's really what we're going to spend most of our time doing today. Um, and then in, my, in, in the section where I talk, and then uh, I'll be interested to hear your discussion of the two papers that I chose that I thought would be kind of interesting. Um, ways to talk about some of these issues in, in more of the context of circadian rhythms. So uh, the first thing I uh, thought I would do is uh, just uh, talk a little bit about how these uh, two things, you want me to be over here, <laughs> how these two things are related to one another. Uh, uh, how we get this notion that addiction is, is related to uh, perhaps something to do with circadian rhythms. So one of the things that we know is that uh, people who are uh, diagnosed as having a drug dependence, or what we often refer to as addiction, have a number of um, disruptions in circadian rhythms that are, are well documented. So sleep wake, cycle, sleep wake cycles are altered in individuals who uh, are using drugs and abusing drugs. Uh, for example, uh, alcoholics have a significantly longer onset to sleep and then uh, less uh, duration of sleep as an example of, of an altered rhythm. Their activity, just general activity cycles are significantly altered. Their eating habits, uh, body temperature, hormone levels, and blood pressure are all uh, significantly influenced in individuals who, who are um, uh, addicts. Um, there is an interesting diurnal effect to drug overdose. So some studies have, have shown, retrospective studies of, of uh, ER admissions in uh, urban settings, uh, show that uh, the, the typical drug overdose comes into the emergency room at about 6.30 uh, in the evening, 6.30 p.m. It, around that range is the most common time for drug overdoses, which suggests that there's some sort of diurnal effect or diurnal relationship to, to drug overdoses. An interesting thing about these disruptions in circadian rhythms is they're not necessarily tied to acute drug intoxication or acute use. So you might expect that, for example, a sleep uh, cycle is disrupted in an individual who's a methamphetamine abuser right after they've taken methamphetamine. That's not a big surprise given that methamphetamine is a stimulant that uh, uh, leads to insomnia. But these alterations seem to persist after long after the drug is, is not currently on board. So you can't really tie it to a, a direct uh, drug effect. Um, the, another thing that, that, that is true uh, is that addiction is, is prevalent in those who, who um, have other disorders that are considered to be associated with a compromised, what's referred to as a compromised circadian clock. So particularly things like um, Mood disorders, uh, major depression, bipolar disorder, uh, those are two examples of individuals who are thought to have disrupted circadian clocks. I don't know if anybody's talked about that at all um, so far in the class, the relationship between circadian rhythms and depression, for example. Not yet. It's actually an interesting, I'm really yeah. not qualified to do that either. I'm not qualified to do anything. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, that's an interesting story, actually. In fact, some people think that, that, that one of the best treatments for depression is uh, to stabilize individual sleep cycles. Uh, 
And, and then finally, uh, the use of, of drugs and alcohol, uh, especially alcohol, seems to follow uh, seasonal patterns. So um, you, you tend to see higher levels of drug use uh, and abuse during the winter months, for example, especially in, uh, like in our country. So these are all, of course, patterns uh, that have some circadian aspect to them. And we can see how drug use and abuse kind of uh, relates uh, to these things. And so that's kind of captured the attention and the idea that these things could somehow be related to one another. So um, that would, might lead somebody to decide that the best model uh, for looking at these issues, for looking at the relationship between circadian rhythms and uh, addiction and, and drug use and abuse, would be to use people. Um, and there's lots of pros to that, of course. Um, one pro is that the phenomenon appears to be present, so people <coughs> use drugs, uh, they abuse drugs, they develop dependence, addiction, um, and there's also these alterations of circadian rhythm, so the phenomenon's there, so that makes sense that, that you would use uh, people to study this. Um, and of course, this is the organism we're really trying to understand uh, and, and really trying to uh, appreciate what's going on with, oh, with something like addiction and, and changes in circadian rhythms. But of course, there's a whole list of cons to uh, studying this sort of thing in people. There's always the problem that it can be difficult to dis, uh, tease apart, which is what came first, the alterations in circadian rhythms or the addiction. Um, that's not clear. Maybe all this drug use is what caused the alterations in circadian rhythms. Really has nothing to do with why they're actually addicted. Could be the reverse. The alterations in circadian rhythms led to the drug addiction. It's very difficult to tease those two things apart. Another big problem uh, with uh, something like addiction, and, and especially if, for example, like in, in, in the one paper where they were looking at uh, cocaine, uh, that's, I think that's what the second paper was looking at, the, the, or well, my second paper in my mind, the McClung paper, mm -hmm. the PNAS, yeah. Cocaine. Um, uh, it's rare that individuals just use cocaine and meet the criteria for uh, uh, addiction, uh, diagnosis of addiction, for just one drug. It's often multiple drugs. So that can be a real problem with studying people. Deficits may be related to some other coincident problem. So comorbidity is a big issue with addiction. Um, and it's also uh, potentially a big issue with uh, clock dysfunctions, uh, circadian rhythm dysfunction, as I just mentioned. You know, there's this potential relationship between circadian rhythm uh, dysfunction and depression, and then there's a relationship between depression and addiction, and who knows what direction uh, those, those relationships go in. Um, and then, of course, the big one um, that, that can be a real limitation is that these sorts of manipulations that we uh, have at our disposal with humans are somewhat limited, right? There's only so many things that we can ethically do um, or we would ever consider doing. Uh, to people. Uh, so that leads a lot, a lot of folks to turn to animals as a model to try to study these things. Uh, and of course, as you all know, um, we can certainly look at circadian rhythms uh, in animals. Um, the question maybe uh, is, can we look at drug uh, behaviors in animals? Well, here's one uh, uh, possibility um, uh, uh, for looking at uh, drug behavior in animals that I wanted to show you. And then um, Get some uh, get some of your uh, thoughts on. So let's see if I can. I know my sound is turned off. So let's see if that will turn it back on. I don't know if that did. Did anything flash on the screen? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it did it. Okay, good. Maybe this will work. This is probably just not showing up on my screen. Okay. Let's see if this works. Let's see if you can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's anything. Okay. 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 Okay.
have been able to hear that very well. Um, but what uh, um, they, they were talking about is the fact that, that Charlie is a, is a pretty regular cigarette smoker. Um, so uh, just from the video, we can see that we certainly can get animals to uh, self-administer drugs. They will take drugs, given the right opportunity. Of course, in the laboratory, we typically do it a little bit differently. But given the right opportunity, they will uh, self-administer drugs, uh, no problem. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, though, was um, a comment that was made in the video that you might not have, have heard very well, which is that the reporter said that, you know, he's talking about what Charlie did, and he said, you know, the problem here is that Charlie is addicted to cigarettes. Um, so the question um, that, that, that I really have for you is, you know, what do you think about that comment? I mean, do you think that Charlie is addicted to cigarettes? Or how would you, cons what would you consider addiction? I think he would probably go through some of the withdrawal symptoms if they just cut him off. If they cut him off, so they mentioned they were going to make him go cold turkey. It's supposed to be this pond because he's an animal. Uh, but uh, but um, yeah, so so you think then, I guess to extrapolate further on your comment, you, you think that uh, withdrawal effects would be an important part of whether or not you would consider him addicted. Okay, what else? Is there anything else? I think the fact that they suggest that he picked up this behavior by observing it suggests that the addiction is not purely on the substance, but also on the behaviors that surround it. So mm -hmm. maybe taking him out of the environment would change the addiction behavior as well. Okay. So then can I infer that you, that, that you would say uh, somebody who you would really classify as addicted would show this behavior in a wide range of contexts, okay, yeah. not just in this one particular context. Okay, so then to, to flesh out a little bit more, then another component of addiction would be um, for, for that would make you feel comfortable saying that Charlie is addicted to cigarettes is if he uh, was put into a brand new environment uh, and maybe even given a very different sort of cigarette than he'd ever had before, you know, it looked different or something, he would still figure out a way to smoke it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's another, that's another possibility. How does Charlie like the cigarettes? What's that? How does he like the cigarettes? Do they like them for him? Oh, oh, how does he like them? Yeah, I, I, they really didn't elaborate on that there, but, but <laughs> I, I think what uh, the uh, notion is is that these people who come and visit him at the zoo, this zoo is clearly not a smoke-free zoo, which probably every zoo in the U.S. is a smoke-free environment. But anyway, that was in Australia, I think it was. South Africa. Or South Africa, yeah, that's right. Yeah, South Africa. Um, they said South African Zoo. But anyway, um, I think the people oh. throw him lit cigarettes, and then he does it. It's dangerous anyway. Throws <laughs> lit cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other aspects that you consider to be kind of characteristic of addiction? Yeah. I mean, like your paper suggested, his reward uh, wiring, I guess. Uh-huh. Um, with the nicotine, I'm assuming. I mean, we couldn't. We can't really kill him and check his brain, brain cells. But mm -hmm. uh, if his uh, reward, what's the word for? If like the VTA mm -hmm. uh, without the nicotine um, isn't as, I guess it'd be less excitable. Uh, so he doesn't feel the reward and the normal things he would do without the cigarettes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess we could test that through like cortisol levels or something. So uh, you would say then that an important, potentially important component of addiction is that there has been some sort of adaptation that's occurred right, over, right. with repeated exposure to the drug that we could measure by looking at how his, nor how his normal brain function that would be responsible for other sort of reward related behaviors that are not associated with nicotine in this case would be in some way altered. Right. Okay, yeah. Another thing. I would say he might be addicted to it if he seeks out the cigarettes when he doesn't have them after a certain period of time. Ah, uh, okay. So he's uh, engaged in drug-seeking behavior um, uh, even when there's not a bunch of people there who are normally uh, throwing in the lit cigarettes. He's engaging in some sort of drug-seeking behavior. That's another one. Yeah. Also increasing dosage. I don't know if that is also related to addiction. Mm -hmm. People who are addicted tend to increase the Mm -hmm. So with, with uh, repeated exposure to the drug, there tends to be an increase in the amount ingested. Right. 
a, an attempt to overcome tolerance or right. reduce effectiveness right. of drug with repeat exposure. To get to the same effect. Right. So that would be another one. So these are all sort of things we could measure, at least some of them. I mean, the brain assessment might be a little tricky, but, but we, we could measure all these things, that's for sure. Um, so let's, let, let's talk about what addiction is in terms of, of, of humans, okay? Um, and the early views of addiction did emphasize the, the characteristic you brought up at the very beginning, which is they emphasize a physical dependence and withdrawal symptom. Uh, associated with it. So when you don't have the drug, you exhibit physical signs, usually a sickness behavior of some sort. Um, and this still influences our thinking about uh, addiction, obviously. You know, people still think about that as a key component. The issue with, with some drugs, however, is that they, um, they don't always have a real prominent withdrawal symptom associated with uh, so in the case of drugs like cocaine and phetamine, while you can talk about a withdrawal syndrome um, uh, that is characterized by things like uh, significant changes in mood, um, uh, uneasiness, restlessness, things like that, it's very difficult to, to see things like um, uh, nausea, vomiting, convulsions, the things that are associated with withdrawal from something like heroin or um, alcohol, which is much more prominent. And so. That, that is, is one component to what, the way we define addiction, but, it's, but it, it, it's problematic if that's going to be the only thing you hang your hat on as far as determining whether somebody would be the criteria for addiction. So there's actually a whole list of things that, that we use to describe whether an individual is addicted or not. And to be honest, the word addiction is actually not even used in this, in this terminology. So this is the... Uh, the I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, of Mental Disorders, which is abbreviated DSM. There's, throughout the years, there's been multiple uh, revisions of this. Um, this picture shows the most recent version until the new one that I think is about to come out very soon, if it hasn't come out already, um, where there's been modifications to how, we, how we're going to classify a whole list of disorders. And these, this manual is used by uh, clinicians, it's used by insurance companies, um, all kinds of people who are, who are trying to determine how to diagnose somebody. Um, and so the DSM, so we'll talk about DSM-4 because that's the one that's been around the longest. Um, the DSM-4 does not use the term addiction. So that, that term addiction is our culture has, has really used this and frankly has abused the word addiction to talk about anything that we consider in some way to be a little bit undesirable. So we talk about being addicted to shopping or addicted to chocolate or addicted um, to whatever that we think we probably shouldn't be so uh, spending so much of our time doing. Um, but when we're talking about addiction and we're talking about drugs, um, what we're talking about as far as the DSM goes are these definitions of substance abuse and substance dependence. And in, in particular, substance dependence is really the um, conceptualizations that we all have of what addiction is. So it's, it's a lot to define, so I'll try to just kind of uh, highlight some of the uh, key uh, indicators that, get, that would uh, lead somebody to be diagnosed as being substance dependent, in other words, addiction. Um, you need to see three or more of the following occurring at any time in a 12-month period. Okay, so right away, you can see that there, is, there needs to be a very long period of drug exposure. Okay, a very long period of drug exposure. I'll tell you right off the bat, when we're going to talk about animal models, you almost never see what I would call a long period of drug exposure. Okay, so right away, one has to ask themselves about the applicability of animal models of addiction to what we're really talking about when we're talking about addiction. Okay, that's a foreshadowing to the message that, that I, I have throughout this. Um, uh, so three or more of the following in a 12-month period. Tolerance, so this need to, to increase your drug uh, intake in order to get the same effect. Withdrawal, these physical symptoms of, of withdrawal. Um, uh, taking the drug in, uh, in higher amounts or over longer periods than was originally intended when you started taking the drug. You know, you just went to the bar to have a drink, and before you know it, you've been there for six hours, and you're uh, completely uh, annihilated by the end of the night. You're so intoxicated. Um, a persistent desire uh, or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control your substance use, okay? You want to stop using uh, this much, uh, as much drug as you're using for whatever reason, 
you want to stop, but your uh, um, uh, efforts have been either unsuccessful, um, uh, even in spite of the fact that you have this persistent desire. A great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to attain the substance, and we can um, give all kinds of uh, examples of, of how you would use most of your behavior during a day, or most, a large percentage of your behavior during your, your day focused on, on some aspect of, of the activities that are associated with your substance. Uh, important activities given up because of the substance abuse uh, or substance use, and then continued use despite these mounting um, negative consequences. Okay, continued use despite mounting um, negative consequences that are um, caused by or exasperated uh, by the substance. So really, I could distill all this down into what I think are a special, three especially prominent characteristics that really differentiate drug addiction versus drug use. So that, that's a key thing here. Clearly, uh, the animal, Charlie, and all the animals that, that, that we could talk about in animal models, they have drug use, or at the very least, they have drug exposure. If they didn't have any say in it, they were just given the injection. They've got drug exposure. But there's difference between addiction and exposure, right? And I think these are key, key aspects of it. Drug seeking is compulsive. Okay, what I mean by a compulsive behavior is it's governed by a strong, irresistible, Im irresistible impulse that appears to be beyond voluntary control. So if you ask someone, they'll say, I, I, I just can't con control it. I'm just, I'm just, I'm driven to, to seek the drug. I can't, I, I have no control over it. It's really an involuntary sort of thing. And this drug seeking uh, tending to occur even when the drug is not uh, available and also being manifested by an unusually high motivation or desire for the drug that some people uh, describe you describe this experience by using the word craving okay they'll say they're craving the drug <clears throat> another thing is continued use despite adverse consequences okay continued use despite adverse consequences you're losing your job your family your independence but you're still using okay that's that's another real hallmark and then a, a third hallmark of, of addiction versus just drug use is repeated cycles of abstinence so not taking the drug and then relapse abstinence and relapse and in that respect addiction or drug dependence is really has really been conceptualized as a chronic relapsing disorder so there's this notion that an individual with addiction is, is somebody who has a disease that is constantly relapsing, well, kind of like a cancer, to be honest, uh, where you have uh, the very real possibility of relapse at any time. So the question that we have to ask ourselves when thinking about uh, Charlie or when thinking about any of our animal models that are tapping into addiction is do they fit into any of these, uh, do they fit these kind of key aspects of the way I, the way I think uh, are, are really define addiction, okay? And if they don't, you know, what does that mean for the data that you're trying to evaluate or, or that you're collecting in your particular model? You know, what, are they, what, is, what do those data mean? Do they mean something more about drug exposure or drug use? Do they mean something about addiction? You know, where is the line drawn? And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So how do we look at this in animals? Uh, and we do talk about these as models of addiction in animals, even though, you know, as, as we think about these and as you read about them, especially maybe if I've refocused your thinking about what addiction really is, these might not really sound much like models of addiction. But at any rate, we'll, we can lump these all into models of addiction. So one of the things you can look at is what you could call the unconditioned effects of drugs. What are the effects of drugs on sort of spontaneous behavior? Um, and uh, oftentimes what we look at is spontaneous motor effects. Common way to do that is to put, a, put an animal, particularly a rodent, this is a chamber for a rodent, into uh, an enclosure of some sort that's often surrounded by uh, photo beams, invisible photo beams, and give the animal the drug and see what it does to their behavior, see what it does to their motor behavior. They did that in one of the papers that we, that we read today. Um, and what they were looking at is the acute response to the drug. And what you're tapping into there is sensitivity. What's the organism's sensitivity to this drug? Okay. And is it altered if we alter some aspect of the animal? For example, if we do something to the circadian system, uh, the clock system, do, do we get an, a difference in the sensitivity to the drug? 
and that's obviously the approach that McClung used. Uh, one of the one of the approaches that she used. Uh, what what about uh, in, in 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 looking at the spontaneous motor effects? We can also look at the chronic response. So what happens if we repeatedly expose the animal to this drug? And there we're looking into at least on uh, well, I forget what I was about to say, but uh, what we're looking into is questions about tolerance or sensitization. So do we see a decrease in effectiveness over time? That's tolerance. Or do we see an increase in, of an effect over time? That's sensitization, otherwise known as reverse tolerance, the opposite. Um, and really what you're tapping into when you're looking at chronic responses is this idea of drug-induced plasticity and drug-induced, um, uh, in other words, drug-induced neuroadaptation that might be occurring. And a lot of people have, have hypothesized that a key um, aspect of addiction is drug-induced plasticity, and that is critical for uh, the development of addiction, is that you need to have the brain changing in a dramatic way. Nobody, by the way, has ever demonstrated what aspect of drug-induced plasticity is critical for addiction. Because uh, there, you can go and do PubMed searches and find and spend days looking at papers that show some uh, lasting drug effect. So you can show drug-induced plasticity until the cows come home. The trick is to figuring out which one or which ones are critical for addiction. Again, it gets back to this problem of studying addiction and studying drug responses, what's different. Furthermore, I guess I should point out, these animals have no say in whether or not they got this drug or not, right? They just get an injection. So what does that mean for, for addiction? I mean, addiction is, at least initially, a volitional uh, a behavior. People take the drug in. They, 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 they've decided they're going to do this. The, the animal, in this case, has no choice. And what does that mean for the effects that it has? This is one way that people have looked at effects on, on circadian rhythms. You can look at how drugs influence free running rhythms. That's kind of what we were talking about previously when we were talking about things like sleep, wake cycles, um, uh, body temperature, things like that. Um, you can look at how drug exposure influences those rhythms. You can look how uh, drug exposure or even a single drug injection can change uh, light and trained rhythms, and that's what they did in, in uh, the other paper that we that we read, the one about cannabinoids. Uh, so that's that's another way you can kind of look at what I would call the unconditioned effects of drugs. So in other words, kind of that um, uh, spontaneous change in motor behavior. There's a whole other set of experiments that would fall into the uh, area of what I would consider sort of conditioned drug effects. In other words. Um, uh, changes in behavior and also physiology that, that result from repeated drug exposure, typically. Or, at the very least, from the pairing of drugs with other sorts of events. Uh, and you, you can show that uh, drugs will very nicely, can very nicely entrain circadian rhythms. Um, I, again, I don't know a lot about this uh, area, but I know that uh, you can put animals into, into an environment where they have no outward stimuli that, that uh, they can use to entrain their rhythms, start to give them a drug injection at uh, the same time of day, and they will rapidly um, entrain to that particular uh, type of injection. Uh, and then the big ones for looking at, at conditioned effects of drugs are drug self-administration uh, and condition place preference. And condition place preference is what was used in the McClung paper. Drug self-administration in the laboratory, so not like we saw Charlie doing. Uh, in the laboratory, drug self-administration often happens, um, first of all, you've got to give the animal a way to ingest the drug. Um, giving rats a lit cigarette and expecting them to uh, smoke it is, is a stretch. Um, I don't know that anybody's ever successfully done that. Um, so uh, what we do instead is to, is to really give the animal a lot of tools to be able to give himself the drug if he so chooses. And so what they've done here is to uh, implant an intravenous uh, catheter that's been externalized through a back port um, uh, in the animal's back. And then on the day of the experiment where you're going to allow him to self-administer the drug, you connect an infusion uh, line, a tether, that uh, connects to an infusion pump that has the drug in the line. And you set up a contingency where the animal is allowed to, for example, press a lever in order to get an infusion of the drug. Okay, and you can, you, you can show that uh, uh, just about every drug that people will self-administer, animals will self-administer. A notable exception is LSD. Um, but but uh, most other drugs, you can show that animals will, will self-administer without, without much difficulty. Um, 
Another option is to, is to do, which is very different of course, is to do condition place preference. So here, you, you're, you're tapping into the animal's willingness to take the drug, right? In condition place preference, if you're not familiar with this, uh, you read about it, but just to make it crystal clear, because sometimes reading about it, you still don't quite get what they did. What you do in a condition place preference experiment is you, is you take a chamber that, um, and there's lots of different ways to do this, but the way that they appear to have done it in this paper um, is to use a two-chamber uh, two uh, apparatus where both sides of the chamber are very distinct from one another. Okay? Uh, what they're showing in this cartoon is there's a unique floor, there's a unique wall here um, relative to the other side of the chamber. And there's a pass-through area where the animal can walk um, to either side. In this particular picture, they're also showing that this box is, is instrumented with photocells so that you can uh, have a computer tabulate the amount of activity that the animal's engaged in on, and then also where that activity was occurring. Was it on one side of the chamber versus the other? So the way these experiments are done is you uh, uh, give the animal an injection, either uh, a, the drug that you're interested, in, interested to see if you can produce a conditioning effect, or um, another compound, and it's usually a saline control. And if they've been given drug, uh, after they, you give them the injection of drug, and then you put them in one of the two environments, and you isolate them, so you, you block this pass through. They're not allowed to go to the other side. You put them in that side of the chamber, and allow them to experience the effect of the drug on that side of the chamber. Then what you'll do is uh, usually bring them back the next day. Occasionally, they'll do this within the same day give them the other type of injection, uh, and since I said we already gave them the drug, this time we'll give them saline, and then, and then we uh, isolate them to the other side of the chamber, okay? And the idea is that you're trying to get them to associate the cues in the environment with the experience of the drug, all right? Then what you do on a test day is to take the animal and place him back into the chamber, usually after he's been given a saline injection, Okay, so you, you try to control for an injection. Give him a saline injection, put him back into this chamber, and this time allow him to walk from one side to the other. And simply measure where he spends most of his time. All right? And what people do is to infer that if the animal has associated one side of the chamber with the drug, and he has found that drug rewarding, he will spend most of his time on the side of the chamber that he's associated with the drug. If, however, uh, he is, does not find the drug rewarding, then he would spend equal amounts of time uh, across the, both sides of the chamber. If he found the drug aversive, he would avoid the side of the chamber that had been associated with the drug. Okay? So that's how the typical condition place reference uh, experiment worked. And then when we talk about these papers, when you guys discuss these papers, we can talk about the data they, uh, that, that uh, McClung showed with condition place reference. All right. Um, now, I thought I had this slide. Um, oh, I know what I was going to tell you. So back to the self-administration. People have demonstrated in, in other studies that um, you can manipulate aspects of, of uh, circadian biology and demonstrate that animals will change their behavior in these paradigms, okay? And this is an ex one example. This was a picture I showed you earlier, and it's, and it's trying to allude to the fact of some of the results that have been demonstrated. And what you can show is that animals who've had this period gene, M4-2, knocked out, uh, will show a threefold higher alcohol intake compared to their wild-type controls. And that's the notion is that's what they're trying to demonstrate here. This is, this is our knockout mouse, and he's more willing to drink alcohol when given the opportunity to do so. So that's the self-administration context. All right. So you might interpret that result uh, uh, as, I hope now that I've talked for a while, you wouldn't interpret that result as saying that, well, emperor mice are, are animals that are addicted to, to alcohol. Emperor knockout mice are animals that are addicted to alcohol. I would hope that you would probably be more conservative and say, well, it appears that they're more willing to drink alcohol. Right? Because really all, all we've been able to show is that they will drink more alcohol than another animal. Uh, that doesn't make them addicted, right? And to drive that point home, I wanted to show you what normal drug self-administration looks like in a rodent, okay? 
and I'm sh actually ignore all this other stuff uh, for now. I just want you to focus on 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 this. <clears throat> in the in the overwhelming majority of drug self administration experiments, in, including the uh, one with alcohol, what they do is to give animals a limited period of access to the drug. Okay, so in the case of cocaine, and that's what we're showing here in this graph. They'll give them one hour of access a day. Okay? So if you're an animal in one of these experiments, what you're allowed to basically do is leave your home cage where you spend all your life for one hour a day, go in and self-administer cocaine if you so choose, and then go back home at the end of the day. When you do that, what you find is that animals engage in this pattern of behavior. So what we're looking at is number of cocaine infusions that animals take um, in a one-hour session when they have what, we, what they're referring to in this, in this graph, uh, in this uh, figure as restricted access, what they will do every day that they're given the opportunity to do that. And what you'll notice is that they do the same thing every single day. They take about the same exact amount of cocaine. All right? This behavior is very uncharacteristic of what people will do. People who take cocaine repeatedly will take more and more of the drug the more chances they get to take it, okay? Um, so this is, and, we, and if I showed you alcohol self-administration, it would look very much like this. They take a just about the same amount of drug every single day the more experience they've had with it. People have noted that that's a problem, right? It doesn't really model addiction. And so there has been attempts to try to look at a different um, model for uh, self-administration in animals. And that's actually what this graph is showing you, a little bit different model. And it's quite simply, all they do is let the animals have six hours of access. And that seems pretty simple because it's just a matter of changing time. But if you do these experiments, I mean, if you can imagine your experiment taking six hours instead of one hour, um, you can imagine that people like to try to do this in one hour rather than six. But uh, what you find is that if you do this over, uh, where they have six hours of access, what happens is people, uh, animals, uh, animals, rats, will escalate their intake over time, which is exactly what people do. They will escalate their intake. So you can get more addiction-like behavior in uh, animals, but you need to change your, your model a little bit. And I'm telling you, the vast majority of times, and what I, what I want you to infer is that most of the things you're going to read where they've looked at um, circadian rhythms, how they relate to addiction, and where they did drug self-administration, they're going to do it in this paradigm. So again, is that addiction or not? I'll let you be the judge. But this behavior pattern is much more consistent with what you would see. It's, I mean, it, it's addictive. But, and this just shows you what one hour drug self-administration looks like in both restricted and extended. So it's not just that extended continue to inject, uh, take the same amount every hour. They actually do show a, a, a great amount of intake during that first hour. So they are different to animals. Um, and then the second result relates to condition place preference, where the mutant might show a complete loss of cocaine induction induced CPP. Okay. And then uh, with a paper that we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, they, they also showed in that experiment that you could influence uh, CPP by altering clock genes. <clears throat> so um, the the message that I'm uh, putting across is that these models have issues, okay, and so one needs to be aware of these issues. And so some people have, uh, have taken other approaches to, to tapping into the addiction uh, phenomenon because modeling addiction per se, so the actual uh, behavior of, of compulsive drug taking and all the things associated with it is challenging in animals. Uh, so some people have taken another approach, and this is actually what we've taken in our lab, which is to look at some of the behaviors that are associated with addiction. And one of the most prominent behaviors associated with addiction is cognitive dysfunction. So human drug abusers display deficits in all kinds of cognitive uh, behaviors, attention, working memory, decision making, inhibitory control, planning of your actions, and also in the in flexibility of your behaviors. Uh, they tend to be much more rigid. Um, and this has been shown in much a wide range of contexts. It's been shown with lots of different drugs. Um, and this is an experiment that um, uh, uh, demonstrated that. It's just one example of a, of a deficit in memory. Uh, and what they did in this task was to do, uh, you know the old um, 
uh, matching game, uh, memory, uh, it's called different things, but where you have the tiles and they, they have, each one has a match and you, and you flip the tiles over and you have to pick them and remember where the matches go. You always did this when you were a kid. And if, by the way, if you ever play this with kids, they're incredible at this. Um, and my kids always kill me at this, uh, this uh, game. I can never do well in it. Um, so uh, um, they basically are doing that same thing in this, in this experiment, but it's on a computer screen. And the way they do that is they show subjects uh, different objects, and this is an example of one object, and there's a different object here, different object here, etc. Uh, and then after they've shown them all the objects, they then flash in the center part of the screen the, uh, the ob one of the objects again, and they simply ask the subject, under which of these tiles is that object located? Okay. Uh, and so, of course, the correct answer here would be under this tile. But they ask them, you know, for all the objects, they ask them where they were located, uh, and they're supposed to tell them where they found them. And if they make a mistake, they go back and they ask them, they show them again and they ask them again, show them again and ask them again. Count the number of errors it takes before they are able to tell you exactly where all the objects were found. And what you find is that uh, control, uh, people who are considered controls, so they don't have a history of, of drug abuse, um, show that it takes them, they, they make about uh, somewhere between five and ten errors, uh, six or seven errors on average before they're able to do this task without much difficulty. Um, and uh, these individuals who have a history of amphetamine abuse show uh, a significantly higher uh, number of errors. So they suggest that they have a deficit in, in memory function, uh, paired associate memory. Uh, you, can, you can see here that uh, there's some suggestion that this might be especially bad in individuals who are amphetamine users. Opiate uh, abusers uh, have uh, uh, also have deficits, but they don't appear to be nearly as bad, at least in this sample, as people who have amphetamine abuse. Uh, and then finally, uh, when you look at individuals who are much, uh, they, they were drug abusers much long, uh, longer ago than these individuals. So these individuals were pretty far out from their abstinence, so maybe they had just gotten off drugs, or maybe they actually weren't really off, off the drug yet. They, they were kind of seeking treatment. Um, even uh, these people who have been abstinent for a much longer period of time, I think it was six months to a year, still show some deficits. Okay, so suggest that these drugs produce these cognitive functions. So this is one avenue that, that would one approach that, that, that you could take to try to understand some of what's going on in addiction. And I'm going to skip through this because we we want to I want to save time to, to, so that we can talk about the uh, the papers that, that we had. Um, but uh, another component to to looking at cognitive dysfunction is looking at the age of exposure as an important variable. And a lot of people do this in their animal models, and that's in fact what what uh, I'm going to show you data from our lab. Not only were we looking at cognitive dysfunction, but we were looking at the age of exposure as an important variable for the types of, of, of changes you might see in the brain. Um, age uh, of exposure and a, a heightened, a potential for heightened vulnerability in adolescence uh, compared to adults is something that, to my knowledge, has almost never been looked at in terms of the circadian effects. So that's a real area of, of, uh, of interest and important uh, understanding. And again, it gets back to what you're learning about the addiction phenomenon when you're studying this in an animal model that doesn't accurately, uh, I don't know, accurate is not the right word, but doesn't fully represent what's going on in people. Because part of what I'm showing you here with this slide is that individuals who, who do have addictions um, usually start that disorder very early in life. They start taking drugs quite young. Those who take them, the younger you take them, the worse off your prognosis. And so, um, uh, it seems to me that that is uh, the age at which we want to really kind of study these things as far as trying to understand um, addiction uh, in the context of something like circadian biology. So uh, anyway, this is just stuff about adolescence. One of the reasons why we, uh, drugs might be particularly uh, problematic during adolescence is that the brain is still adapting quite a bit. That's this figure just shows you. Um, uh, the fact that the brain is, is continuing to develop during uh, the adolescent time period. Um, these are data in humans showing uh, decreases in gray matter. Uh, and these are um, data from rats from uh, Janice Jaraska's lab in the psychology department uh, showing that the number of neurons changes dramatically in an area like the prefrontal cortex uh, in both males and females as they age. So 
uh, we can use animals to model adolescence, and this this uh, uh, schematic diagram is, is trying to give you a sense for um, rat age and human age and how they might relate to one another. Um, adolescence in in uh, humans is generally considered to be somewhere around 11 to 12 years old, and is continuing until probably uh, the very late teens, and most people think that it probably continues up through uh, uh, middle 20s. But this is, of course, a continuum, and people are gonna, you know, it's hard to say exactly when adolescence begins and ends. Um, but certainly there's lots of things going on in the brain during this time period. Uh, you, you can see there's evidence for synaptic overproduction, synaptic pruning, increased myelination, uh, all kinds of changes in gonadal hormones, of course, are occurring. Uh, puberty onset is, as some people uh, think, uh, is, is probably the real indicator of the, of the onset of adolescence. Um, so, so these are all uh, things that are changing quite dramatically. Um, and uh, you can see that another interesting thing that's pointed out in this figure, which again is also ignored in, in many animal models, not just in uh, addiction studies, but also in um, all kinds of uh, animal models of, of human uh, conditions, is that uh, male uh, sex is ignored or gender is ignored. Um, but you can see, particularly the brain, there's, there's differences in males versus females in the timing of when these things happen, this development happens. So that's another factor that, that we really should consider in a lot of these studies. So, um, and this is just talking about uh, not only the anatomical differences we saw, but there's also functional differences. So we'll ignore that. So just briefly, because to, to, to ground you on some data that I want to show you that, that, uh, that speaks to our interests, well, one of our working hypotheses is that adolescents are, in fact, more sensitive to drug-induced plasticity, which by the way, is not a novel concept, and this is what everyone believes, but it actually turns out that there's not a lot of data that directly supports this contention, that, that adolescents do have a heightened sensitivity to uh, dr uh, the effects of, of drugs of abuse. Um, so adolescents are more sensitive to drug-induced plasticity, or in other words, neuroadaptation, and these associated consequences on cognitive behavior. And we particularly think it's due to changes in, in dopamine and or glutamate receptor function in the prefrontal cortex as a brain region that, that seems particularly important. We've, in our studies, have focused on alcohol and amphetamine, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of data uh, with amphetamine. So this is an experiment we did uh, where, we, where we treated animals uh, with, and again, just males, so there's the caveat, right? Uh, just males, uh, and we did this in sprayed dolly rats, and we gave them uh, a dose of amphetamine, three milligrams per kilogram, every other day, um, uh, either amphetamine or saline, I should say, in our control group. We gave them that every other day during a period that is considered to be uh, a large uh, portion of adolescence in rats, uh, postnatal day 27 through 45. And then in the adult exposed animals, we gave it to them between P85 and, and, and 103. And we did it, uh, the initial injection we did in an, op in an open field like this where we can measure activity and measure things like stereotypy, which is repetitive uh, motor patterns of behavior that often develop with uh, drugs like amphetamine. Uh, then we injected them repeatedly in another environment and then brought them back on the last day um, to, to look at them in the, uh, in the monitoring chamber again. And if you just look at what happens to behavior, real quickly what you can see is that both adolescent and adult animals are activated by amphetamine. All these asterisks and letters uh, indicate areas where there's significant difference. Matching letters indicate those bars are different from one another. Uh, the asterisks indicate different from, from sal saline is different from, from drug. Notice the saline bars are almost non-existent. They, they never really show stereotypy behavior when, when they've been given saline. So after the first injection, both adolescents and adults are activated by this dose of amphetamine. After the 10th injection, you see a greater relative activation in both adolescents and adults, which is that sensitization effect. Uh, you'll notice the sensitization is greater, uh, relatively greater in adult exposed animals compared to adolescent exposed animals. So then after we did this, we let the animals grow up for a while. Okay, we let them grow up till P125. So uh, at P125, these an the adult exposed animals haven't had amphetamine for about a month. Uh, well, three weeks actually. Um, about three weeks, and then the adolescent exposed animals haven't had amphetamine for quite a bit longer, um, for on the order of several months. Okay, so the withdrawal periods are different. All right, 
So what happens when we give them amphetamine again and test them in these, uh, in these chambers? So this is when we would give them what we refer to as a challenge injection. Well, what we find is that the sensitization effect has persisted. Okay, they're still showing sensitization even though it's been a long time since they got amphetamine. And remarkably, the adolescent exposed animals, it's been, uh, by the time they got this challenge actually, it's been over three months since they last got an amphetamine injection which suggests that whatever the drug is doing, it's producing a long-lasting adaptation. Uh, and people, and other, other labs have demonstrated that, that at the neural level, however you want to measure it, you can show that, that there's adaptations in response to the drug that persists for this long. Um, so that's what we're looking at there. Uh, and then you can see it's also occurring in the adults, okay? So before we did this challenge, we first trained the animals in a cognitive task. And real briefly, the way this cognitive task works, it, it, it measures working memory, okay, the animal's ability to remember the location of something, okay. Uh, it's, it's done in an operant chamber where there's levers on which the animal can, can uh, respond in order to, get, uh, to earn a food pellet reward. And the way it works is there, here, this is a picture of the front wall of the chamber. There's a, there's, for each individual trial, there's a period where nothing happens. Then there's what's referred to as the sample phase, where one of the two levers pops out of the wall. Okay? The animal's job is to press on that lever. Once he's pressed on that lever, the, the levers retract, and it goes into the delay phase. Okay? During the delay phase, this light comes on in the food trough, all right? and it stays on until the animal makes a nose poke in that um, central food trough. But that nose poke has to occur after a delay period has elapsed, okay? That can be actually no delay, zero seconds, all the way up to 24 seconds. So he can keep poking his nose in that trough for 24 seconds, but it's the last nose poke he makes after 24 seconds has elapsed that actually moves him to the choice phase, okay? And in the choice phase, both levers pop out, all right? And what his task to do is to respond to the lever that he saw before the delay. All right. If he does that, he is correctly matched to the sample, and he's given a food reward. He gets a food pellet. If he's incorrect, he chooses the wrong lever, he goes into this timeout period where there's great shame, you, you, you've made an incorrect response, and you don't get your food pellet. All right? By the way, this, this the procedure where he's required to press his, to poke his nose into the, into the uh, food trough, is to get him to move away from the lever where he made the original response because he might just use a positional strategy and just hang out by the lever and then wait for it to pop out again after the delay has elapsed and then press on it. He wouldn't have to be using his memory and, and, and recalling where that lever had come out. He could just simply stay there. So that, that, that helps mitigate that potential uh, strategy. Then what we can do is to assess reversal learning uh, by switching the contingency on him without of course, we can't tell him. He doesn't understand what we would tell him. So we just switch it so that the opposite lever becomes reinforced. So you're now doing a non-match to sample. All right? You're supposed to respond to the lever that didn't come out during the sample phase. So what do we find? Oh, wait, back up. The reason why we chose this task is because we know it's sensitive to, to lesions of the medial prefrontal cortex. So remember, our hypothesis is the prefrontal cortex is altered in some way. This task is very sensitive to uh, medial prefrontal cortex function and not to hippocampal function because if you leave the lesion in the medial prefrontal cortex, their accuracy, uh, my pointer is dying, but their accuracy decreases significantly as you increase the delay. So their working memory uh, is compromised as you increase the delay after they've been given the lesions to the medial prefrontal cortex, which suggests you need your MPFC in order to accurately use your working memory and perform the task. So what did we find? Well, we found that animals that got exposed to amphetamine were uh, disrupted on this task, but only those that got it when they were adolescents. Okay? Only those that got it when they were adolescents. Because you can see that with increasing delays, everybody starts to struggle on the task, but the animals that got exposed to amphetamine during adolescence struggle the most. Okay? They have the hardest time remembering the location, and they're getting close to chance or just guessing where it was during the sample. We keep training them, and eventually they all uh, get to 85% correct across delays, which is our um, criterion for successful performance. Uh, and uh, everybody eventually gets to that criterion, but the adolescent exposed animals take longer to get to that criterion. If we do the reversal, 
uh, and continue to train them. It takes a long time to get to Criterion because you were, for a long time they maintained their original strategy. Uh, but still, we have a situation where our adolescent exposed animals um, take longer to reach Criterion than our adult exposed animals. Okay. So the amphetamine effect is dependent on age of exposure. Um, this is not important. This is just talking about if, it's, if the parts of the task are really hard, the, it's where the amphetamine exposed animals do the worst. Um, so we looked at this on a physiological level um, by using uh, in vitro electrophysiology with Lee Cox's lab. And what we're able to determine is that both adolescent and adult exposed animals show changes in the functioning of medial prefrontal cortex neurons. And I, I won't get into the details of this so we can talk about these papers. But what it basically shows is that the level of inhibition in, in this brain structure and the ability of dopamine to influence inhibitory signaling in the prefrontal cortex is compromised in animals who got uh, amphetamine uh, during either adolescence or adulthood. Here, it's suggesting that there's not that much of an effect whether you got it during adolescence or adulthood. It's still pretty remarkable because we did these brain slice recordings, like I said, more than three months after uh, the animals got amphetamine originally when they were adolescents. In rat time, that's a really long time. That suggests that there was some change uh, that was especially long-lasting. Per perhaps we changed the developmental trajectory of the medial prefrontal cortex by exposing the animal to amphetamine during that time period. So this is just more data that we'll skip. So, my last slide. Um, second to last because I have an acknowledgement section. The take-home message of this and something to evaluate when you're not only looking at these papers and thinking about what it might mean for addiction, but also in thinking about these ideas of of um, studies that purport to tell you something about addiction is that we need to be careful about that notion, okay? Um, I think that um, the way we can use these models is to study components of the addiction process. Uh, the example of condition place preference. Reward, um, if we uh, are going to um, uh, believe that the expression of locomotor activity on one side of a chamber versus another as an indication of how rewarding the animal finds a drug, um, then that does tell us something about perhaps drug use, but the rat or the mouse in a CPP experiment has got that drug, has received that drug a total of maybe four or five times, maybe ten times. People who develop addictions, uh, who meet the diagnosis for addictions, have, have received that drug hundreds and hundreds of times. And so, it, it's, it's, it's on a different scale, uh, in my opinion. And then, uh, again, another big take-home message is just to be careful when evaluating these experimental results in animals and, and thinking about their generalizability for addiction. So I really think these are valuable um, for looking at addiction-related phenomenon. And, and our approach in my lab, because clearly I have this anxiety about whether or not I'm, I can model addiction or not, is to uh, really tap into um, behaviors and neurophysiological changes that are um, associated with addiction or would be expected to be associated with repeated drug exposure. Um, that's, that's my approach. Um, and, and one needs to think about that in evaluating these studies, whether you're kind of looking at addiction-related phenomenon or addiction-related issues or addiction per se. Okay? And, and maybe the only way to really tap into addiction per se is to go back to, those, to the human situation and do these studies that you're interested in doing in people. Uh, so that's it. These are the people who do the work, uh, as always. Uh, the studies I talked about today were, two, were led by two graduate students. Um, the electrophysiology studies um, were uh, um, data that, that Shore uh, collected. Um, the data I really spent most of my time talking about was actually uh, Cush Paul's data, uh, uh, research scientist in Lee Cox's lab. Uh, and then Luke did all the, the behavioral studies that. that so, think about these things as we talk about these papers that you guys read. Any questions or comments?